I'm Mark Gagan, and you're listening to the Voice of Insurance podcast, produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. The insurance ecosystem really is a wonderful place. It's not just one market, but a series of interlocking markets with their own cycles and separate pots of capital that are interrelated but often uncorrelated. Legacy is one of those corners of the market that we just don't visit enough. In the distant past, it was a bit like going to the dentist. You probably only went when you were in pain. These days, it offers far more sophisticated and much more comfortable legacy and capital management services that are incredibly complementary to live market strategies. And here's the particular interest. Today, we have a live market where reinsurance capacity has dried up and investors are utterly fatigued or openly on strike. And so every dollar of spare capital feels twice as valuable as it did last year. But at the same time, we have a highly sophisticated legacy market that is well capitalised and because of its relatively solid recent track record, has access to more funding if it needs it. Also, legacy infrastructure is probably better equipped to handle anything the live market can throw at it than at any time in its history. Surely in today's market, every live dollar that can be freed up to write new business at tomorrow's better prices will be freed up. So now is clearly a great time to be talking to today's guest. Luke Tanza is CEO of Riverstone International, a business at the heart of the Lloyds and UK company legacy market. Riverstone has a new owner, fresh capital and focus, and ambitious international expansion plans. Luke is one of the most engaging members of the legacy community, and if you haven't met him before, I think you'll find him incredibly insightful and refreshing. And if you still have any outdated ideas about what runoff is in the 2020s, a few minutes in Luke's company will set you straight. Given what's happening in the live market, Luke and his peers' profiles are very likely to be raised a notch or two in the next couple of years as excess demand seeks out his capital and expertise. So get ahead of everyone else and listen on. Enjoy the podcast. This episode is supported by Oxbow Partners. Oxbow Partners is a management consulting business specialising in the London, Bermuda and European insurance and reinsurance markets. In fact, in 2021 and 2022, they were named one of the top 10 consultancies in the sector by the Financial Times. It's fascinating speaking to the team about the kinds of topics they're supporting. Helping reinsurers take a strategic view of their operating models. Designing smart follow syndicates in the Lloyds market. And developing ESG responses. The company's strapline talks about giving executives a fresh perspective. So if you're keen to understand the challenges and opportunities coming down the track for your business... I'd recommend giving the team at Oxbow Partners a call. Luke, welcome to The Voice of Insurance. Thanks, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. We were in a very interesting live insurance and reinsurance market where the reinsurance market's having a bit of a moment. What's life in the legacy market like? It's a very interesting marketplace and has been for a couple of years now, Mark. It's both a factor of the hard market in the live insurance market, but also a factor of particularly Lloyd's performance measures looking at underperforming um, lines of business and underperforming syndicates. Both those factors have driven a lot of activity, particularly from the Lloyds market, as I say, into the legacy sector. And that has been a interesting and busy period for us. So I, I would say it's a very active period, probably the most active period that I've seen in my career with Riverstone. And in legacy, presumably, it's, it's not really about capacity, is it? Because the capacity is more fixed. You know, obviously, what's happening in live market is people are having difficulty working out what their capacity is, for example, because if their retro hasn't given them any price yet, or they haven't had any indication of what sort of retro they're going to be able to have, and people are working out what their e and exposure is likely to be, etc. You don't have that problem, I presume? No, we don't have that problem. And it comes down more to appetite and the availability of capital versus the number of opportunities that are there. The difficulty we have in the legacy market is understanding what is coming down the pipeline. So the pipeline can be quite lumpy. So as opposed to writing new business, although people do need to understand you know, what the rates are going to be like, how much of their capacity to allocate to what lines of business, they broadly know how much business is going to be out there. Whereas within the legacy market, we're very transactional driven. So we need to sort of forecast basically what's going to happen. So we can look at the past and say, last year, this is how much business came to the marketplace, but it's not really that... Um, you can't just project it forwards and add 12% to it in the way that someone who's got a live book can. Yeah, it's, it's trickier. So what we tend to do is look at what's in the pipeline now and try and work out how long those transactions are going to take to come to full fruition. But that's probably the trickiest part about managing capacity in, in the legacy market is just really understanding what opportunities are going to come along. 
because just like any live company, we don't want to be inefficient with our capital. So we don't want to be holding lots of capital that we're not deploying into new transactions. At the same time, we want to have enough capital at hand to be able to take advantage of the transaction, the transactional flow. So that's the trickiness for our industry. Well, let's look at that because presumably what's been a great driver of your business, certainly if I were looking from the outside in the period of market adjustment, which is now seems to be accelerating, has been live businesses pulling out of lines that are underperforming or being forced to pull out of certain lines that are underperforming, maybe by Lloyds, for example. How much of a driver of the business has that been? I would say it's probably been about 50-50. So there's that side of it. And then there's also very much a change in the marketplace where people are starting to look at the providers of retrospective solutions much more as a capital efficiency tool now. So we've had a lot of transactions where people are actually very big live underwriting agencies and very big live companies are looking at how they can free up capital to take advantage of the live market themselves. So it's been about 50-50 with distressed or underperforming lines or complete syndicates that have been put into runoff by corporate members. So it's, it's a real mixture, but I would say it's about 50-50. So it's not even actual legacy, as we would describe it. We used to call legacy runoff, but this is business that's not in runoff. Uh, yeah. Well, it, there's a continuing underwriting relationship, but they want to sever some of the back years just to free up those reserves that they could deploy that capital forwards rather than hold it for backwards. Yeah, sometimes it's discontinued lines of business, and sometimes it's continuing lines of business, but the back years, as you say. So it's a combination of both. And that's where I think the market has changed quite a lot over the last 10 years. Prior to that, you're quite right. It was very much seen to be the distressed lines of business that the legacy market was good at coming around and resolving. But now we've moved into a different area where we're much more seen to be a strategic tool for the live ongoing companies and syndicates to say, what part of the business can we redeploy to a trusted legacy provider that will enable us then to free up capital so that we can redeploy that capital Presumably, this kind of market where we're talking about reinsurance relationships and specialty insurance relationships being fundamentally changed and things that have been bundled, for example, being unbundled, presumably you're thinking you're going to have lots of calls from different people who are now repositioning and that there's going to be more change and therefore more of that kind of business opportunity for you. Absolutely. And we're looking at ways of how we can do that. So it's looking at ways to obviously increase our capital base, but also increase our operational resilience to take on more than we first envisaged. But absolutely, we're looking to take on board and increase where we were last year in the next year. We can't see, as I said earlier, too far into the future, but certainly for the next couple of years and based upon what we've seen in the past few years, we think our earlier expectations are probably underdone to a certain amount. And we think that we could probably increase our expectations going forward, which is great because we have grown to a a good size now. And we do have a good operational base. And I think the key in most insurance is economies of scale, particularly in Lloyd's, you know, diversification and economies really have a major part to play. So keeping at a size and a scale that makes sense to us and enables us to make money from our capital base, but also to grow, but also to take on board larger scale opportunities in the future. They're all really key, important, fundamental things that we're considering when we're sitting back and looking at what's going to happen over the next one, two, three and five years. The legacy market has its own cycles. So where do you feel you are? And if there is a legacy market cycle, in terms of your own appetites, how are you feeling about your own underwriting skill and how that's worked out for you, say, the last five years? Obviously, you know, there are times when legacy deals are very competitively fought over, mm-hmm. and there are times when there is less competition. Mm-hmm. Where are we at the moment in that sort of cycle within your own world? It is very competitive still, and we are very fortunate. We've been in the Lloyd space since 2003. We were pretty active in Lloyd's around 2010, 11, and 12. And then Lloyd's itself went a bit quiet for a while, but also we had different things to focus on. So we focused more on the company market with our purchase of Brit Insurance Limited back in 2012. Yeah. And then some other large company transactions throughout the 2010s. But since about 2018, we've been very much looking at the Lloyd's market, as I said, because of the performance directorate's uh, review on the syndicates, but also because of the strategic nature of Lloyd's. We find that the Lloyd's syndicates are very sophisticated when it comes to thinking about strategy and their own forecasting and their own planning. So we've been very focused on Lloyd's since about 2018. Early days, we were assisted in our sort of development because we had the merger with Advent when Fairfax decided to put Advent into runoff in 2018 and effective from 1-1-2019. And so we merged with Advent at that time. So that gave us a really good boost into the market at that time. It gave us economies. It gave us people. 
it gave us some more capital and some reserve base and a lot of experience in Lloyd's. So it was very opportune timing from our perspective because that enabled us then to use that base to then do more and more Lloyd's transactions and to be very successful, to be candid, in the last four years in the Lloyd space. Some of our competitors are now starting to see that success and are joining into the marketplace. I would say it takes a long time to get into the Lloyd's way of thinking and to the Lloyd's market. So new entrants, whilst we welcome them and competition is great and that's all good, it is a quite a difficult marketplace to get into and to learn overnight. And also, as I say, the economies of scale really play to your strengths when it comes to the Lloyd's business. It's funny that we're in a hard market in the live market and we're in a relatively softer market uh, in the legacy world. Has that affected performance in any way? Do you think are there legacy performers out there that are not performing to expectations because they couldn't get the pricing away? I haven't seen many examples of that. We had an example of a company which went into liquidation because of some of the deals that they'd done that hadn't come off, but yeah. they were very specific monoline deals. It wasn't so much down to pricing as to... Just a lack of skill or well, just a bit of bad luck? Or... It was a bit of both, I think. It was hard to see in that portfolio that went against them. They had an adverse judgment. They were quite small. The way that they were structured didn't enable they them didn't to have swallow. diversification. Yeah. So but we've seen that and that's you know something that we would like to avoid as a marketplace in general. We so, don't want runoff to go into runoff, do you? No, absolutely not. And it's, you know, people do view us still as a marketplace and reputation for us is really important. So we've got to maintain those high standards. When something like that happens, it's unfortunate, but there was very specific reasons for that. But apart from that, we haven't seen any evidence of pricing being driven down. We've certainly stuck to our own pricing discipline. As I said, we, you know, we have got advantages because of economies. So we can be price competitive because of our larger scale. But if you don't hit your returns, it's just not happening. It's not happening, no. And, and we will always insist on that. We have a lot of experience as well in our due diligence, and we will dig down as deeply as we can. Maybe that's the psychology of also the legacy market, because you only get one chance to price it. You mm -hmm. don't have a live market that you can increase premiums next year. You can't. You have to do the deal, and it's one deal, yeah. and it has to stand or fall on what it is. So I presume you're less likely to have a rush of blood. Yeah, definitely. And if you are feeling like there is something in there that you're not completely comfortable with, there are mechanisms that you can put in place. You can put in place additional premiums later on into the transaction. Yeah. You can put profit commissions in if you feel or if the seller feels that it might come back the other way. So there are those sort of traditional tools that are available to insurance companies that we also use. But normally we will try and give finality to the seller and give them that final price. And that means we have to be very comfortable with our due diligence process and also our assessment of what our capital costs are going to be and what our return threshold is, which, as I say, it hasn't changed and we're still sticking with those return thresholds. Obviously, you've got your own pool of capital. You are the legacy market, but you live in the world just like all the rest of us. So how has the macroeconomic climate, which has been particularly interesting and in quite painful ways for most of us, mm -hmm. obviously with the sudden spike in bond yields, mm -hmm. global inflation really coming back mm -hmm. in a way that we haven't seen since the late 80s, how does that affect your own appetites and your own sort of animal spirits as a market? It certainly makes us think very closely about those things that you've just mentioned. And they're things that we haven't necessarily had to focus on for some years. So it's really just going back into the toolbox and saying, right, okay, so we've got rising interest rates on the one hand, which could be seen to be a good thing because obviously our, good for investment, income. our investment income, our assets are going to eventually yield more um, income. Of course, you've got the short-term mark-to-market impact as well, which you have to take into account. But on the flip side of that, you've got the rising cost of capital, particularly if you've got any debt leverage in your capital stack, and you've got obviously inflation on the claims as well on the liability side. So you have to have a look at all of it in the round, and some of it balances itself out. So although it is new, it's not necessarily, oh, that's really changed that impact, but hasn't had an impact there. So for example, you may have some marked market losses on your asset side because of your bonds, but if you hold relatively short duration bonds, so if you're mismatched on your liability, yeah. you'll actually get an uptick in your capital. So your regulatory capital will come down because you get a bigger discount on your liabilities. So you have to look at it in the round. So although from a P&L perspective, short-term mark-to-market losses may make it look like not a great year, you have to think actually regulatory capital requirements have come down because we've got bigger discounts on our liability from the solvency to technical provision side of things. That's and probably a nice thing about not being a live business, not having to be worrying about what your quarterly results look like as well. Within the world we operate, we do look at our results very closely. We do set some KPIs around our financial performance. But I think we do have a little bit more time to sit back and say, this is a longer term result. 
and a longer term play. So when are the unrealized losses going to unwind and come back into us? What's the higher yield going to mean to us? What does the inflation mean to us on an ultimate basis? Are the 10% that we're seeing at the moment, when are they going to come down and we can get our actuaries working on that to have a look at it? So it's really interesting and it's given us a big focus on it. But I would say it's as much as an opportunity as it is a, an issue for, for it's us. It's not in a the worry world. for some of the business you already put on your books, presumably at a time when you're hoping you're projecting 2 or 3% inflation into the future, just standard economic inflation. Mm -hmm. And now, obviously, we're near a 10. Mm -hmm. Is that a worry in the back years, or do those it, rising bond yields help? We have to have a look at it and make sure that we feel like if there's more inflation over the longer term, now that we've entered into this shorter period of high inflation, that we've taken that into account in our reserving. That said, when we price those deals, we may not have priced the inflation in, but we also would have priced a very modest investment return in. So that's where I'm saying, you know, there should there be is enough a, for quid pro quo. There on is that, a, yeah. a balancing out, not always, because sometimes the rate of inflation will increase greater than the interest yield. But we look at those things very, very closely. So we look at our reserving. We normally do it half yearly. We have a look at our reserves. We track our reserves on an actual versus expected basis monthly. So if there's something that's coming through from inflation that means that we have to adjust our ultimate reserves, then we'll do so. And that's just part and parcel of what we do. We take risks off people and we take it on board ourselves. So we have to be prepared to handle those risks and to deal with it if it doesn't always go the way that we would necessarily like it to. When I first met you in the 10 years ago, we were just talking about this before we turned the microphones on. You were much further east and now you're right in the heart of the city in a classic market building minster court where everyone who's ever come to the london market would have met someone here in the last 20 years it's almost a symbol of you being so much closer to the market and the legacy market's got much closer to life you know the mm -hmm. business is not some really ancient sort of unmovable old reserves that are just don't seem to be going anywhere things that are sort of intractable and things that need to be sort of cleaned off someone's balance sheet and move on to yours so the legacy market's got so much closer to live. I mean, how much closer do you think it can get to being actually live or unexpired? Do you think someone will be asking you to remove some unexpired risk off their balance sheet? We already are seeing opportunities where we're taking on board premium reserves and we've got unexpired risks. And to a certain extent, that's always been the case. So even when you go back to the 90s and Sphere Drake, when we first went into runoff, we had longer term policies back then. So it's always been something that we've had to acknowledge. Even when we took on board some of the syndicates in 2010, 11 and 12, yeah, there were some longer term marine policies in, even in that business then. But certainly now where we're going much closer to the sort of like the three year RITC cycle or even further into less than three years live underwriting year in some of the lost portfolio transfers that we've done. Yeah, we're taking on board some UPR. So we do have to look at that really closely in our Due diligence and, and UPR, unknown premium reserve. reserve that's yeah, right. Yeah, good. So it measures up the unexpired risk. So the premiums earned as the risk basically expires. So we've got some unexpired risks there. So what we look at there is the reinsurance program protecting it. What loss risk mitigants do you have? So what's the size of the net line? We look at whether or not we actually can carve that business out potentially and leave it with the sellers or the vendors or reinsure it back into them. And quite often, if it is longer tail business because of the relationship that they have with the policyholders, some of our students and clients do want to retain that business anyway. So there is ways that we can actually take it and then reinsure it back into them or look at it if they want us to take it very deeply at the due diligence to see what our view is on that unexpired risk, whether or not the reinsurance program already in place that we're getting as part of that transaction covers that off or whether there's extra reinsurance that we need to think about or other mitigants that we need to put in place. You were talking before about budgeting, and, and it's always difficult to know what's coming down the track. But does the fact that you are closer, and now you're much more a consultant of the live market, that more likely to be tapping on the shoulder, do you find that you've got a better vision of what the pipeline is likely to be, because you're much closer to these people? Yeah, they do talk to us, and they do sort of give us some heads up on where the potential future inventory may be coming from. But it is quite interesting. Some of the future inventory... And some of the lines of business that don't do very well in the live market are actually good lines of business for legacy to get involved in. So take aviation, for instance. It's very difficult for a live insurer to make a lot of money out of the aviation market. But from a legacy perspective and from a claims perspective, once the reserves are established, the reserves don't normally get a lot worse on an aviation perspective. So as long as the reserves are well established, even though it's not a great performing line of business for the live insurer, it could to us be fantastic inventory because we don't really care about loss ratios per se. 
it's an indicator that we take account of. But what we take account of is where are the reserves set? So if a line of business is 150% alternate loss ratio, but they're reserved at 150%, that's not to us, concern, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's fine. Are they correctly reserved or yeah, are they exactly. not? exactly. And I suppose with something like aviation, this would be a classic sort of situation where someone's entered a class that is obviously very specific. And of course, if you're going to do aviation, you need proper aviation underwriters and you need a very specific infrastructure with a specific aviation claims team because everything aviation is all in its own language, isn't it? And so, of course, you can add value by having an aviation claims team. Yeah, which because, we do. And we've yeah. got a lot of aviation experience. So it's good for us. And I was going to say earlier, when we get to that scale size, it's not just the capital scale and the diversification credits that we get through being larger in our liability base. It's also the operational scale that we can achieve so that there's not one line of business, I think, that we don't have some experience in. Now, we're obviously more expert in some rather than others but we will always buy in expertise where we don't have it. But it really, through our operational scale and, and the recent growth that we've had, we now have most lines of business covered from a claims perspective. We also do maintain an underwriting team because we do have those unexpired risks. So there's a quite a lot of endorsements that need to be taken care of. So we do maintain a good underwriting team as well. They came from specific lines of business backgrounds, but they're very much generalists. They very much work with the students or the clients to work out what are the important things and features to take forward from an ongoing underwriting perspective. So it's not just claims we look at, it's also endorsements and looking after the interests of the clients going forward. You're in the firing line. When we're talking the live market all the time, we're talking about plaintiff lawyers taking over the world, nuclear verdicts, now nuclear settlements. That adverse trend, the social inflation trend, we've been talking about economic inflation, but now social inflation, are you worried about that trend, obviously, because you are directly exposed to it? Yeah, and it is something we focus in on. Um, again, I, I don't use the word worried, but it's it's something that we're very, very attuned to and something that our actuaries will have a look at and particularly and our you're claims sure guys you're as well. For. Yeah. So, you know, we do look at watch lists very closely when we're doing our due diligence. So we look at not just, you know, verdicts that have already been received, but what could be coming through the pipeline as well. Most companies do have fairly good watch lists that do list early days where something, even if it's in its infancy, might go wrong. And that's a very big focus for us when we're doing our due diligence. Again, there's not much we can do at the DD stage except for price it and have a look at what the reinsurance mitigant might be around that risk. But once we do get control of it, um, we do have claims experts who are very much just focused on getting the right result. So working Should with try and get lawyers, out of that horrible jurisdiction and, and yeah. move it to a new forum if you're or, lucky. <laughs> or just settle the, the claim if it needs settling earlier rather than waiting for a fatalistic outcome. Our claims guys are very experienced at that. A long time ago, people in runoff were accused of sitting on claims to earn the investment income on the asset side of it. That's just really crazy stuff to do. We have the opposite. We try and pay claims as quickly as possible. Because there's one thing that's sure, the longer you leave this stuff, the worse it's going to get. <laughs> so um, we have a very keen appetite for very good close claims management and for where it's proper to get the fair value of the settlement to do it as quickly as possible. So you're doing a lot of business in Lloyd's. Lloyd's is a syndicated market. What we mm -hmm. don't tend to see many syndicated deals within legacy. Do you think as some bigger deals probably come in in the next couple of years, do you think we'll see syndication? It could be something that does enter. At the moment, what you tend to find is that people go out and try and find third-party capital to support the larger transactions. You know, we've seen sidecars come up in our marketplace quite a bit, quota shares off the back of some of the transactions, and sometimes that doesn't get publicised too much. But there are, in some of the larger deals, some of the larger sort of traditional reinsurers do sit behind and do partner up with the legacy provider in order to do that. So they're the sort of more of where people are looking, as in what sort of ways can they sort of use traditional reinsurance or find third-party capital as opposed to syndicate? Because as you know, syndication, it's really good if it's already set up, but setting it up from scratch, you know, the Lloyd's system with the leads and the follow market and those leads have been built up over a number of years with expertise, that could take a long time to sort of replicate and to get that trust level in a separate legacy market. We probably will all think that we're the best at doing that transaction. Well, you do so currently for, lead everything you do. Exactly. So I talk to thousands of live underwriters and they all say they lead pretty much everything they do, but of course, actually, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> they can't possibly all lead everything they do because no. otherwise it wouldn't be a syndicated market at all. Exactly. So it's a similar sort of issue there is but who, when who takes these, some of these follow syndicates, do you think follow only strategies? Do you think they might follow you into runoff? That could be a possibility. I haven't spoken to any of them about that specifically yet, but that could be something that could be quite interesting. 
whether their algorithms can be attuned to looking at our transactions and seeing how I'm sure our track record is done. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure we could probably have a look at it, but it's certainly nothing that's come to us yet. But it could be an interesting way to get extra capacity into the marketplace. Obviously, you've got new ownership. Has that changed the way you run your business? And the difference between being a Fairfax company and picking up the phone to Toronto if you want more capital and now talking to your new owners, what's the difference? There's not much of a difference at all. And this is something that I've been trying to get across in quite a few of the panels that I've been on. But PE is out to make sure that you're as efficient as a business as you can possibly be. They want to make returns. And that's in everyone's interest. You know, we want to be as efficient as business as we can be. So if they've got some ideas on how we can improve our efficiency, that to me is great. So they are probably more communicative from that perspective than our previous owners who led us pretty much to more autonomy. That's not saying that CVC are telling us what to do. They just keep coming up with a lot more ideas of how we could do things. Or do they bring you business? They bring us contacts quite a bit. They do bring us introductions. And they try and understand our business and they provide good challenge and good support. I guess the biggest difference is that they are really bought into our model to have a growth in our business model and, and to have our company become the premier legacy acquirer in the, in the marketplace. Fairfax had a lot of other distractions going on. They had lots of live companies. We were just one in a number of people vying for capital and vying for attention at, at different points in time. CVC see it different to that. You know, we are very much a, a focal point for them. We're a large investment for the Strategic Ops Fund, and they want us to be successful, so they're going to help us along the way. But as I say, that help is really help. It's interest, it's support. And having that kind of owner, though, does it set a particular clock ticking, though? Does that worry you in any way? Or, or Not really. It would if they said three to four years, potentially, because by the time you'd done some of this stuff, I mean, we've already been under CVC's ownership or stewardship now since August last year. So we've had 14 months already. So it goes pretty quickly. So if you said you had a three or four year horizon, I think that would be quite difficult for someone, particularly in legacy to manage. But we're in the CVC Strat Ops Fund, and that's a six to eight year old, could be even longer. Sometimes they do hold acquisitions for longer than that period. So to me, that's a good period. It's a period where we can see where we're at. We can use their expertise to build. We've got time then to think about what CVC want for the long-term future from us. You can so, really have a deeper relationship as well because you yeah. can invest the time. Yeah, so right from the outset, you know, this has always been to them at least a six to eight-year play, if not potentially longer. So you don't have, yeah, really, that's parked in your mind. That's not something you have to deal with. It'll be here before years. we know it, but um, <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, it's not something that concerns me. And I think we've got time because, you know, there's certain things we are wanting to do, which is we are wanting to look at when you said earlier about the future. You know, I said we're planning one, three, five years in the future. We're not just looking at Lloyd's expansion. We're looking at what we can do internationally yep. because Riverstone has always been very much a, a UK-centric firm. We've had opportunities in Europe, but most of the times when we were still part of the EU, we were bringing books of business out of Europe back into the UK. So we've had some experience with Europe, but we've never really expanded much beyond the UK from a Riverstone UK perspective. So now we're looking to expand into territories further abroad. So we've just established Riverstone Bermuda Limited. So we're going to start to look at using that as a platform for Bermuda-based transactions, primarily North American, US you know, reinsurance transactions yeah. to start with. If we can use that as a base to then go into the States directly, if there are opportunities there, that's fantastic. So that six to eight years gives us an opportunity to build out that model and to become much more international as well, which I think is really important for us for our future. Anywhere else? What about Far East, Middle East? We haven't yet got a plan to go there, but obviously you never say maybe, never. Maybe for the next investor. It possibly could be, or it could be towards the end of it. I think, yeah, we're moving fairly swiftly on our Bermuda setup. We've also bought off Argo, their Maltese company. So we do have a company in Malta now as well. And we're also looking at other strategies. It's how many strategies you look at at one time. So I think we're certainly focused very much on the North American strategy with also a little bit of Europe at the moment, whilst not losing sight of our main source of business, which is obviously the UK which has been a fantastic source of business and an area that we're really well versed with. So we're having lots of changes happening, partly pure market driven, people moving in and out of different classes, particularly in specialty. We've got war related business, political risk business, one that expects and obviously anything property cat related as well is all being chopped and changed and which could be a driver of new business for you. 
But something that's coming more from a regulatory perspective is ESG. That's the three-letter abbreviation I've been talking about more in the last two years. Something we weren't talking about a huge amount before, when we were talking about corporate social responsibility probably before. But ESG has really come to the fore. And it's something that's now driving business change, as we've seen with whole classes of business being pulled out of oil and gas, carbon-heavy industries. Do you see that as a big opportunity for you guys? It's something that we have to explore. We haven't yet seen it coming through into fruition as new sort of opportunities for us, but I think it is very much something that we could focus on and and work on with the live carriers on how to transition that properly and how to communicate it. Because I think communication is the key because those risks aren't going to go away. So the live carriers probably don't want the publicity that's associated with some of those risks, but at the same time, they can't just exit them. So they have to find a solution. If they transition it over to us, I think that's a good solution for them. From their PR perspective, we have to then make sure that we market and let people know why we're taking that business on because someone has to do it. So give it to someone who's responsible to make sure that we actually are doing the right thing, you know, the right claims work and coming out with the right outcomes for those policies because those policies can't just disappear. And I think that's half of the issue, isn't it, is is educating the general public as to why those policies were written, what length of period they cover. Um, why they need to continue to be written in some instances over a transitional period. And the insurance industry needs to work out what does the end game look like and how does legacy providers like Riverstone have a part to play and in, do that, you think, in accelerating that. Yeah, that legacy is going to end up with a lot of that carbon heavy business and going to be more carbon heavy, probably by default, is what my intuition would say. And therefore, you're going to have to deal with that, the potential negativity. And then obviously, maybe you have to plan for having a lower ESG score than other people just because of the nature of your business. Yeah, potentially. And that's where it comes to how we score ourselves and how we communicate that out. So you'll recall that, you know, where a lot of legacy came from was from the asbestos pollution and health hazard marketplace. So with the APH, with the P being pollution. And we do have still on our books quite a bit of pollution on our company side. No one really is protesting and holding out placards saying, why are you handling these pollution claims? Because we think we're doing a really good job this for the environment, is, yeah. you know, cleaning the environment up. That's, that's what we do. You know, we've got reserves in place and we're cleaning up those pollution sites through paying out the claims. So in some ways, it's fantastic that that pollution ha- does have that focus because I'm not sure in a live organisation where they're still concentrating on, again, quite rightly, on the 2022 cat season and what's going to happen in the 2023 renewals, if those pollution liabilities were still in that organisation, how much attention would they be getting as opposed to having those now carved out to us? They are front and centre part of what we do and we have very experienced claims people looking at those pollution claims. Yes, at some point in the future, that legacy might have a higher cost of capital just because it has to. Mm-hmm. and then, But that's going to be part of the cost and, yeah. that's, and that's part of the cleanup. But that's the service, isn't it, that we offer the market. In the old days, it was cleaning up those very latent issues like APH. Going forward, the issues may get quicker and quicker, and we may still have to be the solution for some of those problems. But that's what we offer, and you know that's where our skill set really comes to the fore. We want to take a lot of that opportunity cost away from the live carriers. So if they're spending time in the boardroom talking about um, discontinued business and talking about strategies of how to promote that and how damaging it possibly could be for their PR, then obviously there's probably another solution for them, which is pass that problem on to someone else who's used to dealing with, with legacy and latent you know, issues. So Come down the road and have a word with Luke, I think is, is well, the solution, yes. Yes, definitely, that would be great, <laughs> um, you know, if it was me or someone else. But yeah, that's, that's the idea. We're sitting in the London market. For the whole of my life, the London market has been modernising. But it seems to be we're now at a moment where we can probably see a genuinely digital marketplace that's end-to-end digital. It's not happening right now, but it feels that it's definitely going to happen. You know, we can see it at some point in the medium distant future, but also I think everyone feels now that it's something they do have to plan for. You're getting closer and closer to live. What do you think a fully digital market with no friction, what do you think that's going to do to legacy? It's hard to see a fully digitalized market with no friction. (laughs) So I think that's the first point. There's always some friction. There's always got to be some friction and there's always got to be some complexity and it's working out the angles of it. Anyone can really run off very quickly a short tail book of business that has no complex claims in it that are pretty much going to go according to the stats. So a motor physical damage book, for instance, you know, there's not going to be any real expertise in running that off. 
there'll be systems and people that you have to put in place, but there's no real value that we can add to that and it will be done in one or two years. However, involved in that motor book will be some very complex motor liability cases that may go on for years and years and years. It's hard to see how the end-to-end digitalization can assist on those really complex matters. You know, it's like when people were trying to write the perfect reinsurance calculation kernel. They'd think they'd crack it, and then all of a sudden someone would pull out another reinsurance contract that had a different structuring to it, you know, the top and drop or a cascade that was coming down. So then someone said, oh, how do we program that into this perfect reinsurance system? So there's always areas where digitalization and technology, which is fantastic, will provide great efficiencies. But there will always be areas outside of that where experts and... Where there's, you know, one bodily injury case is actually going to the Supreme Court and they're going to change the way that structured settlements are. Uh, You know, you probably need a pen and paper for that kind of stuff. Yeah, or you just need to have a brainstorming session. I mean, you may be then able to change your programming, but there will always be checkpoints on it. So to get to the day where you've got a perfect end-to-end frictionless system we're not going to see day traders. At the end of the day, they've bought something and then they've sold it back to you at the end of the day and they've either taken a profit or nursing a loss. And that's not going to be happening, is it? I don't think so, no. I can't see that happening at all. But what I can see is, is efficiencies around the edges on that. So really honing in on what is the important stuff to move off your balance sheet onto a legacy provider's balance sheet, much more focused on the economies, on the efficiencies. And I think that that's something we're already starting to see. But as people become more and more technology aware and embracing the more digital end-to-end, I think some of these issues are going to become more apparent, as well as some of the general problems being resolved much better. So I think it's, again, another opportunity for legacy, because I think these systems will show where the problems and the pinch points are, and that's where legacy can come in and help on those pinch points. Just like to summarise, obviously, we're talking about a very difficult market for a lot of the live market, but is it right to say... It's a difficult live market. People are going to be making some tough choices with their own buying their own reinsurance and other things, and that may affect what they what they can and can't do. But it sounds like legacy has got an appetite and it's got capital and it's got access to capital. It's a different pot, and you sound in pretty good health, right? In very very good health, and it's not limitless. Nothing is limitless, but there are a lot of opportunities at the moment that we can look at. What we need to do is make sure that we don't get complacent because those opportunities may not be there. We have to continue to sell ourselves as a company, but sell the industry as the provider of those solutions to those pinch points that I was talking about minutes ago, and really make sure that we continue to promote the industry as the safe pair of hands for dealing with the problems that people who are still live writing should be passing on to someone else so they can focus on really working that hardening market well. Luke, thank you so much for your time. I think loads more questions bubbling from my mind, but I think we're out of time. So we'll have to deal with those questions at some point in the future. So thank you very, very much. And I hope you'll come back on the show. That'd be fantastic. Thanks, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, don't forget to subscribe or leave a like or a review or recommendation on whatever podcast platform you used to access this program. These really help get the word out. Before we go, just a quick reminder that advertising slots are available here and in other places in the Voice of Insurance podcasts. Podcasting is the fastest growing medium and attracts a high quality audience of key decision makers. It's also an intimate medium where you, the listener, are right in the room with me and the interview subjects. Needless to say, that means it's a great way of getting your message out directly to an audience because you know you've got their full attention. It's also very cost effective. So get in touch with Mark at thevoiceofinsurance.com to find out how you could be speaking directly to the industry. The Voice of Insurance podcast is produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise-scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. Voice of Insurance is produced by me, Mark Gagan. Music was written by Anna Gagan and produced by Carlos Gagan. Check out more podcasts and written comment pieces at www.thevoiceofinsurance.com. (laughs) 